Hi, this is Scott Bradfield. This is uh, episode 33 or 34 of Reading Great Books in the Bathtub. And we're concluding, I'm kind of kind of hastily concluding our discussion of William Gaddis's J.R., or our reading discussion, simply because I've got to close the book on it and move on. I, I read the last couple hundred pages again in the past couple of days. And again, it's a very funny book. And once you do the work in the first first few hundred pages of understanding how he introduces characters and how the, the and remembering these names because there's so many people Beaton and Beamish and Brisbane that sometimes it's hard telling them all apart it doesn't hurt to sort of note some of them down and realize you'll probably read the book again it, it is a sort of book that one of the few books I can think of that benefits from being read more than once and being read several times because it's always funny it gets funnier as you as you understand the characters I wanted to say a few brief things today because most of the concluding chapters, last few hundred pages, um, are easier to follow if, you, if you've worked, done the work in the first half. But uh, I wanted to say what, something I started to say in the last lecture, which every time I read J.R., it, it reminds me of hearing my parents talk about how much they loved listening to radio. And in many ways, I, I think that this is probably the world's greatest radio comedy drama. And that my mother used to tell me about some radio show where it was, I think it was Flibber, McGee, and Molly. And every episode, someone would go to a closet because someone someone kept the closet full of crap. And every time they went to, to the closet at home, you would imagine this huge mound of crap pouring out of the closet. There would there'd be this huge noise, this, this cacophony of, of sound effects in the radio studio. And that, and I also remember listening to Jack Benny, the great Jack Benny radio shows when I was a kid, one of the few radio shows I listened to and loved when they were replayed on records. And there were those long sections where J Jack Benny would go into the vault to visit his money. And, and, it would, and you would imagine all of these amazing things as he went down this river and there was vast safes and there was, there was, it was in this deep cave and, and, uh, you could imagine this amazing landscape. And and I really do feel that this is what's happening in JR all the time, especially when we get into that nightmarish apartment house that becomes JR's corporate headquarters and is the is the kind of the, the place that the Gibb and Shram have been living uptown in some really crummy part of town, basically to have girls over or or to live cheap and write their great novels. And it's a it's a nightmare. So I'd like to start, uh, do a few brief quotes, and then lay, leave you to the book. But one of the one of the great, some of the great passages that always moved me when I when I get through this book, on oh, four seventy three. We I want to read a little brief passage where Mrs. Joubert often, or Amy Joubert often runs into uh, Jr. coming in and out of that payphone that Jr. set up outside the school, and and she tries and she realizes this kid thinks about nothing but money. And she tries to get him to look up at the sky. This is the bottom of page 473. And a little kid says, you know, he's 11 or 12 years old, he says, Like, did you ever think, Mrs. Joubert, everything you see someplace, there's this millionaire for it. So you see a building, a millionaire, you see a box of toilet paper, a millionaire. Everything is some millionaire made money off it. And Mrs. Joubert says, is that all you think about? Sure, I mean, look back there. He blocked the door by way of opening it for her with his back against it, bringing the wind in. He's opening the, the phone booth door for her. Like right now someplace, there's this water fountain millionaire and this locker millionaire and this here light bulb one. I mean, like even the light bulb, there's this glass millionaire and this one off where you screw the, oh, wait, wait a second. Down that bright, empty corridor, the telephone rang in the booth. Could you just wait up for me a second, Mrs. Joubert? But she reached past him to push the door, leaving him off balance there a foot in each direction where the wind brought in a wrapper and the three musketeers' candy bar. See, I just, just, okay, wait a second, I'm coming. And he ran up against her on the steps. Just stop for a minute. She caught an arm around his shoulders. Just stop and look. What? At what? At the evening. At the sky, the wind. Don't you ever just stop sometimes and look and listen? Well, I mean, I mean, sure, I... He stood stiff in her embrace, his arm load holding her off between them. 
it. So when someone's being showing affection to JR, he's just not used to it. Like it's, I mean, it's like getting dark real early now. Yes, look up at the sky. Look at it. Is there a millionaire for that? But her own eyes dropped to her hand on his shoulder as though to confirm a shock at the slightness of what she held there. Does there have to be a millionaire for everything? This kid just doesn't understand any of that. He understands no relationships between people except money. All of his all of his uh, relationship with Bast, who's his best friend in the book, really is is trying to get this guy to do stuff for him without having to give him money, and then trying to help him make money. He doesn't know any other way to deal with him. There's a wonderful scene which I I was going to read near the end of the book. Jr. Jr. builds his huge financial empire out of paper. And he's sending Bast off on all these little excursions throughout the, the last third of the book. And one of them involves a, they, they've somehow bought the mineral rights to a Native American reservation. And J.R. has some deal. He's trying to get the tribe to do something for him. And he delivers him a whole pile of uh, crap, a bunch of washer dryers and, and sewing machines and, and, uh, and uh, oven, uh, toaster ovens and just crap. And he delivers all this stuff to this reservation, trying to impress them and get him, them to like him. And he doesn't realize that the reservation has no electricity. <laughs> They're all pissed off at him. And as a result, all these things, this whole network of lies and bullshit, because J.R. has been lying and telling everyone he's a grown man and making fake phone calls and has this huge m m mass of lies around him, a Trumpian, a Trumpian personality who's been living off so many lies, he can't keep them straight. And near the end of the book, the whole empire is collapsing. They're losing everything. And Bast and, and J.R. are going along in a car. They have some sort of town car or something. And in the course of it, J they're eating a sandwich. And Bast and J.R. says, are you going to eat your pickle? J.R. says, could you have your pickle? And Bast says, sure, you can have it. And J.R. says, I'll trade you for it. I'll give you something of mine for your pickle. And Bast gets really upset. And he says, you can have the pickle. <laughs> J.R. is very puzzled that anyone would give him anything. And again, it's not a, it's not a manipulative scene like, like you would get in some literary novels. It's a really felt scene that this kid doesn't understand that you don't have to trade for the pickle. So I would like to just give a little brief uh, summary of what's happening in the, after this passage. We have um, an interesting set of relationships start to develop. The book slows down quite a bit. And Gib and, Mich and Ju Amy Joubert, and Amy Joubert's husband steals their son. And she's going through a quite big nightmare because her father and this huge, this huge money-making empire has done everything it could to co-opt her into this, this foundation fraud in order to avoid taxes. And her husband's trying to do something similar and steals their son, takes him off to Switzerland, and she's totally bereft. All these people have lost their kids. They're all losing their children. Or they're living with, or they're being taken away from each other in these weird divorces, horrible divorces. And uh, uh, Joubert and Gib meet on the train. Gib's a total drunk by this point. He's been hauling huge boxes of this book, this major book he wants to write. And he's always reading it out loud in the last few hundred pages. And other people are finding pages lying around and reading it. And it's very intelligent and incomprehensible. It's a lot of rubbish. It's just so clever trying to write this big book, and it, it's useless. It's a terrible book, and only funny in how bad it is. But he goes with, with, with Hubert, Joubert to her apartment. She takes him home with her, and they have a few-day affair. And, and there's some long descriptive passages of their lovemaking, which are almost entirely at the bodies and the physicality of the bodies, but it's quite beautifully written. And a real relationship blossoms there. It's a real slow part of the book. And um, Gib is quite happy, and she's quite happy. And she tries to stop him from drinking, and she's trying to sort him out, and she's trying to explain that even though he's a mess, he's more interesting than these horrible people at the, at the stock market. And she has to go off to find her son. She disappears from the book, basically, from that point on. And Gib is left with this mountain of crap that he's trying to write this book. And then we go into one another incredibly long scene. It must be 50, 60 pages, where Gib, it goes back to the apartment where Bast has been living with. Rhoda is the girl, who is Shram's ex-girlfriend, and she basically sleeps with anybody. And uh, there's, a, there's actually a little sex scene between her and Bast. And 
she meets uh, Gib comes over at one point, and this apartment is the funniest, most funniest parts of the book. I I I can't even find a passage to pick. It's just so it's just a hilarious escalation of chaos. And again, there's water pouring out all this. All of this is pure radio. Water's pouring out of all the taps. They can't find the piano. The radio voice is coming out all the time. At one point, uh, Rhoda goes into they, they, the oven. There's no electricity because they haven't paid the bills. And the oven's being used to shove all of JR's correspondence because Bass is now using it as an office. And Rhoda, at one point, goes into the bathtub. It's the only safe place in the house and, and is using some soap. And, and it, soap is all over the apartment. And constantly delivery people are coming to deliver the rubbish that JR is ordering, like, I don't know, huge crates of toilet paper or, or forks or all these, these terrible pieces of junk that JR is buying or getting cheap deals on or coming into this apartment. And in the midst of it, Gibb is trying to write this novel. And it's a very funny, just really basically a hundred pages of hilarity. It's really a funny section if you'd follow it. And JR is coming and going and Bast. And the Empire is building and building until everything collapses. Now, there's, uh, I don't know if I want to talk much more than that because the, um, there's, there's a long passage in the last hundred pages, which is where everything collapses. And it's sort of a calm. Uh, Edmund, Edmund goes to the hospital meets another guy and he he's collapsed he's just given up on everything and he and he's still trying to write music he can't stop himself and all of these guys these artists in the book are just compulsive they don't even know why they're trying to do these books and 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 Edmund is actually writing he's decided he can't write his symphonies because he can't find a pencil <laughs> he's always looking for pencils so he's writing crayon he has a crayon and he's writing sets cello music which is kind of a nice metaphor at the end of this one artist still trying to write the music at the conclusion of the book. Um, and the the old women who started the book, Anne and whatever, the ants, the two ants that live out in this old house. You remember there's hammering and all the cities coming and everything's being built up around them. And the entire house, Edmund goes, goes home to find his aunt, his two aunts, and finally meets Cohen, the lawyer, who's trying to sort out this inheritance issue. So we have from the beginning of the book, Cohen trying to find Bast, and they come together finally at the end of the book. And when they meet, the entire inheritance, which is the house and all the property, has disappeared. The old women have disappeared. It seems to have just been collapsed or taken apart. It's like the end of Little Dorrit, in a way, where everyone's you know, this, this huge house of, of lies and nightmares just completely falls to the ground. And the old women just disappear. And we have a few, several closing scenes that are really nice in the book. And I guess I'll just close, I'll close with one brief passage. But all these writers try to, all these artists are trying to figure out why, why they are trying to write books or make music or paint pictures. And they feel like they've all been failing all their lives. And I wanted to read a little brief passage here. And... This is Edmund, 718. He says, I failed enough at other people's things. I've done enough other people's damage from now on. I'm just going to do my own. From now on, I'm going to fail at my own. Here, those papers, wait, give me those papers. And that's a great little line. He says, I've, I've been failing at all this stuff of doing music for the zebras and doing JR's crap, and I want to fail at my own art and fail on my own terms. And it's a wonderful little closing part of a book that is sort of a 725-page dense novel about a writer trying to figure out a reason to write a good novel. And it's done with great kindness and great, and great joy at the conclusion of the book, because it's a very joyful book, J.R. It's hilarious and joyful, and the writer having a great time throughout. I don't think I don't think Gaddis ever has that pleasure in his later life, those last two books of his, are, are you know technically good, and he he wrote really lovely prose, but uh, the the actual joyousness of J.R. It, it should be it should be enjoyed, and everyone should give a shot give this book a shot. You need to read it twice at least to really get that pleasure. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, I hope this was a little clearer. I thought the last episode was a little disjointed, but uh, well, I'm trying to learn how to work all this, these contraptions. Okay. 
Take care. Have a good uh, week. We'll find something else in the next few weeks to read.